Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. I'm here with my partner, Margie. Hey, Margie. Hey. It is January 23rd, 2024, and we're super excited to have back for part two of what I think is an epic Mormon Stories interview, Tara Herbert. Hey, Tara. Welcome Hi. back. Thank you <laughs> for having me. Um, for those who didn't join us for part one, stop this, pause it, go watch part one, listen to part one, and then come back. For part one, we talked about Tara Herbert um, uh, being adopted into a Mormon family as um, a person of color. Uh, she was raised in South Jordan, Utah. Um, we talked a lot about how she dealt with being both an adopted kid and um, a black child and, and black adolescent kid in ultra Mormon Utah. Uh, playing basketball and and uh, doing all the normal teen stuff, but feeling a lot of normal Mormon teen shame. And uh, we also talked about her going on a mission to Atlanta and the trauma that she experienced on her mission uh, <clears throat> and having a friend uh, die by suicide and uh, eventually uh, coming home pretty broken, in her own words, from her mission, meeting her husband, uh, and uh, getting married, not in the temple at first, the shame parade that followed, and then finally um, getting sealed in the temple to her husband and to their newborn baby. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of where we left off. And uh, what we're going to be talking about in part two of this epic interview is, uh, you know, her mental health, having kids, her marriage, and uh, meeting her um, birth parents, birth mom, her biological mom, and then sort of her Mormon journey that included kind of a faith faith um, crisis. Yeah. And so that's uh, going to be what we're, I think we're going to cover. What did I leave out? No, that covers pretty much all of <laughs> yeah? it. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So let's let's maybe go back a tiny bit uh, to the birth of your first kid. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I guess you had some mental health, you confronted some mental health struggles uh, with yeah. the birth of your first kid. And we should say you had them from your mission. You you would you know for those who haven't watched part one, pretty much PTSD and uh, panic attacks. Yeah, from your mission experience and depression and anxiety. So. Yeah. It's not like you just were uh, mentally perfect in terms of your mental health prior to your baby, but yeah, no, yeah. I would agree. Um, but I guess at the time I didn't realize the, any of that, right? Um, so my first baby, I got pregnant three months after I got married, um, and yeah, I definitely didn't feel ready. Um, mm -hmm. But I think in Mormonism, right? That's your only option. Um, and it's looked like a, a good thing. Like when you're now having kids, um, my husband was still in school, finishing his degree in information systems. I had already gotten my cosmetology license, um, and was doing hair at the time. Um, when I was still pregnant, um, towards the end of my pregnancy is when I feel like I started dealing with more mental health issues. Um, I don't know, just feeling very, just dissociating a lot, you know, mm -hmm. um, feeling overwhelmed with like being pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, and I just didn't feel like how a lot of people will talk about like a connection to their baby right away. I didn't feel any of that. Um, and I don't, I think now I would say it was from just like having a bit of attachment issues um, from As being adopted. adopted. Kid? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. not really recognizing that at the time. Um, I don't know. Like when I was pregnant, it was just like, yeah, I'm pregnant. Like I, I don't know the baby inside of me. I don't know who he is. Right. Um, and people were could be weird. Like I was like eight months pregnant in a at a Smith's in Orem, Utah, and a guy was like hitting on me, um, <laughs> and it felt very much like he thought I was like a 
single black mom like trying to save me. Hmm. Um, so it was weird because I was like, I wasn't wearing my wedding ring because it didn't fit at the time, but I was like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, um, so just weird experience. I don't know. I just, I cannot think of any reason why a man would hit on a pregnant woman in Utah other than trying to like save them. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Or think that they're saving them, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So my first baby, I tried to go natural at first. Um, I just really wasn't prepared to have a baby. Like I, I feel like when my, I was just learning about how sex worked in mm-hmm. general, like at the time I had my first baby, I didn't even know how ovulation worked or how to get pregnant, you know, like that's how naive I was Mm -hmm. of getting pregnant. It was just like, yeah, like you have sex and a baby comes like, but they don't talk about like, well, technically you can only get pregnant, like maybe a couple days out of a month, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was very overwhelming to just be pregnant and expected to give birth to a baby and not understand how it all works and not even knowing how to find the best care for yourself. Um, Had I known now that like, you know, maternal deaths, 75% of them are black women, um, Mm -hmm. I think I would have done more due diligence at finding a really good doctor. Um, Because at the time I felt like the doctor that I found Like he would say things like it wasn't an option, right? Something that I was really afraid of when I first got pregnant and had heard about was episiotomies, um, which is when they cut you from your vagina to your butthole so the baby can come out. Um, I was very afraid of that because I had talked to a couple women and every woman that I knew that had had that done never had another child after Cause it was just so traumatic. And I feel like when I talked to my OBG at the time, he acted like it's just not an option <laughs> to, to not have one. Yeah, mm. exactly. So my first child, um, I tried to go natural, but then I got an epidural because I just, it was too painful mm-hmm. and he ended up doing an episiotomy. And so that what that is I didn't tear all the way but I was one degree so like one part away Mm -hmm. from that um and it's just I don't know it was just so weird because I felt like that that was very traumatic I don't know like everything was fine with my baby and everyone was like oh the baby's healthy the baby's healthy and I was again just like the shell of a person, you know, like almost having a out of body experience of like, I don't know yeah. when I gave birth, I don't know. And not realizing like how much more support I needed, um, and being able to not feel that way. But at the same time, that's when I started feeling like almost disillusioned by the Mormon theology Um, because I had given birth to my first child alone. I did it right. But when you go to the temple, you're taught that we all came from God, um, and he created us, but I had just created a little, a literal being. Um, so it's kind of started to like shatter this, like, mythology I feel like of like how how the world began and how everything got to be and it made me a little bit angry with like the priesthood power um because I was like what do you know about creation like I am creating and I did create and yet you're telling me that a man did this all like I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then there's like I somebody, I can't remember who said it, but it's like, I didn't come from your rib. You came from my womb. Yeah. 
Um, and that's very much how I felt. Like, why am I listening to men talk to me about creation and what it's going to be like and how it is when I literally have created? Like, I'm the closest thing to it, you know? Yeah. Um, and then even because, you know, in Mormonism, at least I was taught that, like, we would create other worlds after we die, you know, through the priesthood power. And it's like, that was weird too. Cause I'm like, well, I'm already creating worlds, right? Like women create life, <laughs> like, yeah. and yet it's the priesthood power that's supposed to do that. I don't know. So it just was a very weird place to be in. And I was very mentally not okay. And I think that I had a lot of PTSD from my birth, from birthing my first child. Really quickly <clears throat> from your outline, you, we talked last time about uh, the, the whiteness of the temple ceremony being problematic. Mm -hmm. There were some gender disparities in the Mormon temple ceremony that you also listed in your outline. Mm -hmm. Do you want to address that? Because it kind of touches on what you just said. Yeah. You mean... <clears throat> Like when it comes to the actual temple ceremony of like the covenant that you make, oh, yeah, and that you made and, my, and the veil and you know, the that, yeah. that sort of thing that was always hard for me. Like, I feel like out of every audience who does who never went through the temple, yeah, what you experienced. So, you covenant to your husband as he covenants to God. Um, and so it's easy when you're not married to kind of like not care about that part and just be like, it doesn't mean anything. But then once you do get married, um, that's just not how I was raised. Like, honestly, I'm going to blame it on my <laughs> on parents for not raising. Like, it's like funny that they, the, we have issues with this, but like they raised me to think that things are equal. Right. And so then to like go and be like, oh, now I have to covenant to my husband as he covenants to God was so weird. It all is just weird. And it's weird to think that like you see this video of God, Jesus, and is it Michael? I mean, there's Peter, James, and John, but there yeah. is Michael who I think who's Adam. creating the world, yeah, right? Yeah, like Adam. when they're showing like, yeah. Adam, like, create the world. Yeah. Um, after I gave birth to a baby, like, I just couldn't pretend. Like, it felt make-believe to that me. That all creation was men creating. Yes. Yeah. Because I just was like, you literally have not created anything. <laughs> like, and I don't want to, like, the only reason why I'm, like, downplaying, I guess, more so men's contributions to creating children is because of how much my contribution in Mormonism is downplayed mm -hmm. as a woman is so downplayed. And like, just from that video, right. Of having shown three men creating the world, I would say is a great example of how they downplay how much they just like, not even downplay, just get rid of women. <laughs> When it comes to creation. Yeah, erase. Yeah, erase. Because there's no mother in heaven helping co-create the worlds, even though in Mormon theology there's supposed to be a mother in heaven or multiple mothers of heaven. Yeah. In the temple ceremony, creating women are absent completely. Yes. And so at that time I felt like, it, and I still feel like it's very disrespectful um, to me as a woman um, to pretend and act like, men's contributions are greater than what a woman's contribution to are life the is. the only contribution. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Literally the only contribution. Yeah. Not even like, yeah. yeah. And then Eve's just there like, stupid Eve. Gosh, <laughs> she had to go and bite that fruit. Like <laughs> just putting Eve as this, I don't know, just like dumb. It's very like 1950s humor. Right. Of like, you, I love Lucy kind of thing of like, you're just dumb and there, you know, <laughs> and making fun of women. Dumb and there. Yeah. <laughs> and like existing for what the man wants you to be. 
Exactly. And like, don't talk too much. <laughs> like, let's cut her lines. Like, is that, that's probably like when the prophet was like, how much, how many lines should Eve have? <laughs> they like, were like, ah, oh, she says three words. That's too much. Like, <laughs> get rid of it. Also, like, she's the one that disobeys and, and yeah. attempts at him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just like you're, you know, like you probably were made to feel as a teenager, mm. the temptress, the, temptress, the sinner, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the weak one. And it's just, I don't know. It, it, it became very weird to me after having created literal life, <laughs> yeah. having birthed this child to add to the human population of the world that is literally going to keep the world going, right? My contributions <clears throat> to the world is going to be for generations and to be absolutely just erased. Yeah. Um, and so mm -hmm. now it's not even the erasal of just the color, right? It's me as a whole being. And I just felt, and I still feel very disrespected in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then I don't feel like I had enough support, right? Like after going through all of that, there was no one to, I ended up, back in the hospital because I had a you, you, urinary tract infection travel to my kidneys. Mm. And it just was like, I didn't even know how to take care of myself yes. because of the lack of education around our bodies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense to me. I mean, do you, with the PTSD and you experiencing what you experienced you know, after the birth, do you find that there are parallel themes at all with regard to, let's just say women and are what you experienced on your mission being this narrative when you went out, there's like this ideal and this narrative mm -hmm. of what it's going to be. Yeah. Then you experience it and it's sort of like, uh, not really informed consent, no idea what you were really facing. And yeah. once you're facing something really traumatizing, no support, no resources. <laughs> and some of those things can like show up in birth too, right? Like Absolutely. this idea, there's this narrative, there's yeah. this ideal, there's this expectedness yeah. uh, for you to do it, no question. And yet you go through it and you're like, wow, this is really, really different. And it's my body that actually is paying a cost, which is beautiful and lovely if you have informed consent and you're truly choosing, mm -hmm. right? But do you know what I mean? Do you yeah. find parallels between where it makes sense? Like, oh, no wonder my PTSD was kind of triggered and then lack of support and resources after. Yeah. I mean, immediately after, by the time I had gone to hair school, I knew I didn't want to be a stay-at-home mom, right? Um, and that was really difficult for me because my husband and I had been raised, right? That like the woman stays at home with the kids. Um, and so there was no conversation around, like, I just had to start working part-time. Um, there was no conversation around, like, maybe we could afford daycare. It's always assumed it's just too expensive. Right. Um, which it's actually more affordable than you think. And you might be able to afford daycare if you just look into the costs of how much it actually is. Um, but yeah, it was just instantly now, not only am I feeling broken again now, like literally physically from this birth, like mm -hmm. legitimately, I, it, it was so traumatizing to like have to take care of myself and be like, what has happened to my body. Like, yeah. I couldn't even ride in a car, you know, because you're just like in so much pain trying to heal from this, I don't know, um, from the trauma of birth, right? And yeah, it was a lot. And then I think the worst thing for me was being at home now with my baby. My husband had to work multiple jobs while he was in school, right? We lived with my mother-in-law at this point and he is just really gone a lot of the time, either at school or at work. Um, so I'm just alone with this baby. Um, and not, like I said, I don't feel like I really felt bonded 
to my baby when he was born. Like, I feel like my first thought when I looked at him, I had gotten such terrible acne while I was pregnant. And my I looked at him and he had perfect skin, just porcelain skin. <laughs> and I was like, he, you took everything from me. Like, you just sucked me dry. Like... And I don't even know you, you know, and right now I don't know if I want to get to know you because I feel really broken. Um, And then to be expected to breastfeed, I really couldn't. I tried for a month, but it was just Mm -hmm. too much for me. Like I just I desperately wanted my body back and to be like mine again. It felt like I was just like, yeah literally used um Mm -hmm. yeah it was hard it was hard to first have that baby and I just kept going to this place of like dissociating really um to survive the day I feel like I just had to be on my phone constantly just to like tune out what was my real life um and I started just isolating myself from everyone around me like besides for my husband or my mother-in-law who I lived with like I really stopped talking to friends family um I don't know it was very and like like you said like I felt like how could anybody want to be a mother like because this is awful like it just felt so awful um yeah And so then I started, I I felt really empty, really lost. Um, So I decided that I was going to, maybe what was missing was my biological family and that connection, you know? Um, So that's kind of what led me to start trying to find them was just because I was so, I don't know. Maybe if you rekindled your connection with your biological mom, it could help you kindle a connection with your kid yeah yeah that's probably what I was thinking I just was like any way that I could like I don't know like reach out find somebody who could help me you know Mm -hmm. because I feel like from all the women around me they just kind of were like yep like this is it (laughs) like this is normal (laughs) like we just suffer (laughs) and so This theme really is like you're even using similar language to your mission, right? The suffering that you witnessed, right? For people of color that you were like, oh, I guess. So it is some, it it seems like very, um, I don't know, emotionally adjacent, I guess, experiences. Did you, it feels like now you're in another situation Mm. where you are feeling uh, bereft, overwhelmed, were you able with your, you know, new child to have help? Like, did you get help this time? Did you have resources this time with regard to your mental health? Um, no. (laughs) So you faced that alone? Yeah, no, I did not go to a therapist or anything, um, like as far as childcare, I feel like my mother-in-law helped us a lot to watch the child, but I feel like, and I feel like that sounds like I'm like still so detached from my kid to watch the child, to watch my son. I had help to, in that regard, in care, in care, care, Uh which thank God, because I don't know who would have raised him because I'm was just really mentally so checked out and detached from yeah. reality. Yeah, I was so detached. So you're finding your birth mom. Yeah. So I had done years prior to this, my mother-in-law works at Ancestry. Um, and so prior to this, she had gotten me a DNA test to find my biological family and I had done it before this but had just never looked at it 
um, to see if it found any connections. Oh. Um, cause I just thought I'm, I'm okay. I don't need to find them, you know? Yeah. Um, and so this time I actually logged in to look at, to see if it found any DNA matches and it found like a bunch, um, and a lot of first cousins, um, and had a lot of, I don't know. Like, I think in Mormonism, we assume that like, we are the only ones that do our genealogy (laughs) when it's very much worldwide. People like to do their genealogy. So it had a lot of like up to date records and all this stuff in there that I was just like, whoa, this is like insane. Um, so when I was first adopted, my LDS social services accidentally sent a form to my parents that had the names of my biological parents on there. And so my mom made copies before sending it back um, so that I would know their names. Um, so I messaged, just started going down the line of people who I was um, closest related to of who was, if they knew these people, right? I was like, do you know these people who had a, a child during this year in 1994? Um, and I ended up connecting with my cousin who his mom and my dad were siblings. Um, and he said... I know they have one child together, but they, they've only ever had one child together. But let me ask my, like, that's my mom's brother. Um, and so he put me, he connected me with my aunt, my biological aunt. Um, and she called me and we, that was the first time I spoke to anyone of my biological family. Wow. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so she said that my biological father had passed away um, because this was in like 2017 and in 2013 he had passed away, Um, which I started crying. Like I just, Mm. I don't know. It was just like surreal to be like, I'm never (laughs) going to meet this person. Um, But at the time I was like, in the next life, I'll meet him, you know? Mm. Um, And then she said that she would reach out to my mom to see if she wanted to, my biological mom, to see if she wanted to have a conversation with me. Um, At the time I didn't know that my biological mom and my father um, their families were not close and they did not speak to each other like, like regularly. Right. So like they just didn't talk to each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. So kind of a family divide. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Mm. And so she was like, let me reach out to her to see. Um, so then my biological mom ended up calling me, um, And yeah, and then I booked a ticket to Lake Charles, Louisiana, to go and see all of them. Um, Yeah, and that was very interesting. So how soon after the birth of your son Mm -hmm. did you travel to go and meet your biological mom and kind of family? Yeah, he was probably like eight months old. Yeah. So So he was still a baby. Yeah, it was very soon. Um, And my biological father and mother never told anyone that they had a second child together. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody knew about me. (gasps) Yeah. You were a surprise, a total surprise. Well, a secret. A secret, yeah. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So, yeah. But at least I had the DNA to prove (laughs) that we... We're related, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so... And and I think people sometimes don't realize it's not like just because it's your biological mom. 
it's going to feel like your mom. Mm -hmm. Those are wirings and networks that build up over decades yeah. that make you feel strong emotions for a human, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the fact that you share DNA with them. Yeah. So like, I'm curious what your expectation was in meeting your mom versus kind of the reality. Yeah. I feel like my expectation at the time, I was still very Mormon thinking that I didn't know what I was going into. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. I was assuming that maybe she had her life together. Maybe she like the reason I was thinking, maybe the reason why she placed me for adoption was cause like they were on drugs or like, you know, the typical, like maybe they were too young. Maybe they, I don't know. I didn't really have high expectations except of needing to just know where I came from and maybe that would explain why I was feeling so I don't know just like wanting more I don't know like my life was so not how I envisioned it but at the same time I also didn't really envision a life for myself you know yeah kind of was just following the status quo of what's expected. So what do you want to say about meeting her? Yeah, it was really hard. <laughs> so I took my mom with me to meet my biological mom. Um, and it was, I was expecting, I don't know. I, I think it's like regular in Mormonism to like expect to feel like you're like going to save someone, you know? And when I got there and realized that she was fine, not just fine, like thriving, right? Like she had since remarried, um, well, married. She never married my biological father. Um, I don't know. It was like the answers that I thought I was looking for was not what I found. I mean, do you thought she'd be like a lower ses single mom struggling yes yeah um, maybe not very edu well educated yeah i thought that i would be happy it would make me feel blessed to be raised in the family that i was raised in and grateful but instead it just made me angry because <laughs> she was doing pretty well yeah not just well fine like Doing yeah. great. better than me yeah. like <laughs> so yeah yeah it was very hard and not even just that seeing so my older brother I have a biological older brother who they kept and then I have a, a half brother who's like 13 years younger than me 13 or maybe maybe like 10 I don't know that your mom raised yeah so she raised both of them. I was the only one placed for adoption. So it'd be like, why, why me? Yeah. yeah. It made things, I feel like, almost worse. Yeah. Um, because then I was like, what? Like, I would have been just fine living here. And it would have been almost maybe easier to, like, be raised around family. And they, like, all of their family lives right there, you know, and so close. And, like, my older brother got to meet my um my older my dad so I feel like it's just it was really hard because I didn't get to have a relationship with my uh biological father and to be able to have to see that my older brother did get to have that relationship get to have so much that I didn't get to have um but then I just kept telling myself to be grateful for because I was raised Mormon at least I had Mormonism right because <laughs> that's what we're all on this earth to get so at least I had Mormonism but by that point Mormonism hadn't led you to a lot of health and happiness it had yeah. led to a lot of trauma true yeah but you maybe you weren't at that point I didn't realize, yeah. yeah, I was just thinking like, well, it was all worth it because I have Mormonism, mm -hmm. like at least I have the right yeah. religion, right? you know? 
That's like, where you were when at the time you met. Yeah, your mom. because yeah. even my mom was like, "Well, you could do your um, father's work, um, do his temple work." Yeah. Like, oh, this is so great! Like, we can all be Mormon. Um, right. And I just, I don't know. It was a lot to be able to navigate now. I just added more complexity to an already hard situation. I don't know. Um, and I didn't realize at the time that the emotions I was feeling were grief, you know, and envy of my other brothers that did get to get raised here. Um, and just pain, you know, from the things that I had already been through. It just felt like a lot. Yeah. And yeah, because you'd been through so much. You you know, the, the upbringing where you always felt like you were broken and didn't quite fit in to the mission where that broke you to the trauma of, of the shame parade after your mission. Yeah. To discovering poverty in Atlanta and the racism and the structural racism and then the baby... Like you yeah. had been through so much, then you go to meet your mom thinking it's going to maybe make things better. And it's almost like it's another trauma. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the part of like, I don't think I was ever raised with like the realization of how traumatic adoption is just in general. Like right. this is like. Yeah, I forgot that. Like what I was experiencing like with my son of not feeling attached to him um, was very normal. I don't know. And I feel like now that I know it, not only know how adoption trauma kind of works. Um, I feel like what I was experiencing with my son was definitely normal um, to not feel like I could create strong attachments, you know? It's, it, it just seemed, it's like years and years of poor education or miseducation, not in the sense of like, didn't go to good K through 12. Yeah. It's just whether it's sex education, education about systemic racism, about poverty, about mental health, about adoption, about families, about emotional, psychological well-being, healthy communication skills. Yeah. Like, real impoverishment of just fundamental aspects of education. Yeah. Not, not to be demeaning to your education. Just no, no. You know what I mean? I don't Which know. tends to come from open conversation. <clears throat> yeah. Just, really. there just wasn't like, yeah, a lot of communication in those terms when it comes to like emotional intelligence and, you know, yeah, it was just a lot. And to add on top of it, yeah, now I'm, like, trying to reconnect with my adopted family and adding grief of a loss of a parent that I'll never meet. Yeah. Um, it's just, yeah, it added to it rather than helped it. Mm. And I think if I would have been going to a, a therapist, they probably would have told me to hold off, you know, yeah. and advise to wait. Um, right. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about meeting your mom at that point? Um, no, I guess I'll, I'm people probably wonder why, because <laughs> that's right common. Like, if everything's good now, why would she? Why did she play, end up placing you for adoption? Um, so at the time, my biological father was on trial for first degree murder. Um, he had been in a car with someone who the driver of the vehicle purposely ran over somebody that he had an issue with. Um, he got acquitted. So, cause right. It wasn't premeditated. He had no idea that the guy was going to do that. Who was driving the car. Um, your, your dad was the passenger. He was a passenger. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So he got acquitted, but also he had bipolar disorder that was often unmedicated. And so he was um, just like emotionally, physically volatile, you know? Um, so their relationship was very 
up and down um, because of that mental illness that he had. Um, and so she just felt like she wasn't equipped to raise us both and thought I would be better off being adopted. And she wasn't like a young mom, right? She was like 25, 26. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so she placed me for adoption. Um, and I thought maybe hearing that story would help, but it did not. It made it worse because I felt even more angry that she was older, like getting more context behind it. Just like, I don't know. It did not help. It mm -hmm. just felt more and more like I was abandoned, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so you come home with that baby and things are actually worse. Yeah. And now I have to keep up a relationship <laughs> with all these people. Um, it was very overwhelming how much family like was reaching out to me, wanting to be Facebook friends, wanting to message on Facebook, wanting to talk, wanting to know me. And I just felt like I just couldn't deal with it all. It was too much to deal with. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until after that, that I got, we got sealed in the temple after. Um, and I, again, that was another thing that I felt like might help <laughs> to get sealed, but because like, finally I was back on the right path, but then getting sealed, I had never done a sealing in the temple before. Right. So this is the first time. And it, again, just made me a little bit angry. Um, so for those who haven't been through the temple at the end of this video, you have to go to this veil and like, there is, what is it? A bar that you knock on that has like a little knocker. So that's the same thing you do when you get sealed, except now the person behind the curtain is your husband. And that made me so mad. And I asked the sealer if my husband was considered God. Because the, cause the person on the other side of the veil has to bring you through the veil. Yeah. But it's signifying God, person. right? right, right. Yes. It signifies God. So in this case, your husband, when you're getting sealed, your husband brings you through the veil in the place of God. Yes. Yeah. And it made me very upset. Um because, right, that's what it's signifying, that my husband is For my sure. God. Yeah. Which is sick. Very sick. Um, you wonder why ab abuse happens to, sig to tell a man that he's his wife's God is, I don't know. It just made me very mad. And this, all the sealer said was like, that's something you can ponder in the <laughs> temple. Um. And a an Orthodox Mormon who's trying to make excuses would say, "Well, no, it's your husband. They're they're your you know, they bring you through the veil, but your relationship is still with God. But but just like you said before, you don't covenant with God in the temple as a Mormon woman. No, you covenant with your husband, and your husband covenants with God. Yeah. Also." You're both given new names. Tell tell everyone how how the names work. Yeah, so I'm given a new name that I tell my husband, but he doesn't tell me. His new name. His new name. So another thing that further signifies to me that he is representing God, right? Because through the veil, when I first went through the temple with my new name, I told the the officiant who represents God my new name to get into heaven. Right. And same thing with doing the ceiling. I tell my husband, my new name to get into heaven. Um, yeah. So that was like the one aspect of it that I just was like, this is so, I don't know. They probably should have just given me some answer, any answer because letting that fester is what, <laughs> Was my unraveling, you know. Oh, that was the beginning of the end? Yeah. I think it just that started those questions of like, what does, because like in Mormonism, the theology, there is description of what a male's afterlife will look like, right? You'll be able to create worlds without end with your wife by your side. 
Or wives. Or wives. Yeah. Um, but for females, I'm just there, just the supporting. Actually, it's worse. You're making babies. You're making billions of spiritual babies. Yeah. And that was like also something that I just was like, at the time, I did not, I didn't even know if I could go through having another child. I was just so, like, that was so hard to have my first child, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And so I just was like, there's no way, like, that was not heaven for me to just like birth babies and stay at home taking care of them. That was hell to do, you know? And that was my, that's the rest of forever. So good luck. Mm. Yeah. So you started doubting Mormon theology at that point or not? Like, is that too strong of? Yeah. Or not doubting, but hating it, resenting it. Oh. Yeah. Resenting Mormon theology. Yeah. And that's a weird place where you actually still believe it, but hate it. Yes. Exactly. That's different than not believing yeah, it and I hating it. Definitely still If you believe it and hate it, what's that like? Yeah, it was awful because it's like you're just trying to come to terms with it. It's almost worse. Like it, I feel like it would be better to just like not believe it, but to really I still believe that that was reality and my future, right? And now I felt deep regret for getting married so young, deep regret for having kids so young because I was like, this is the, I had the rest of eternity to do this. Why did I do this so young, you know? Um, Cause it could have been, I could have waited. Right. To not enjoy life at least. <laughs> right. At least I could have en- enjoyed a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. So it was just, I don't, I, it was depressing making, right? That's like the thought that like, this is reality. I'm just depressed. Like. And then you start seeing it in other Mormon women when you sit in the pews. You can tell Mm -hmm. the heaviness of all of us of of that realization. It's like you can see it now. That is anyone really happy? (laughs) You know? One thing people don't know is that kind of Mormon women in Utah have very high depression rates and prescription drug, you know, use and abuse rates. Yeah. Mormon women in Utah. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, we can't do, we don't, it's not like we can have marijuana or psychedelics. So, of course, turn to. And, or, or a rewarding career or yeah. recording education, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. You would just are literally left with a broken body, literally from all your children um, that you have and a theology that doesn't support you right an eternity of spiritual baby making yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and that's what yeah i literally would just sit in the pews and i could just see it and it's like we're never nobody's having these conversations these aren't the conversations you're having in relay society (laughs) right like it's not like i don't know it was like being opened up to this world that like i never saw before you know Like I had an assumption that like everyone's so happy just being stay at home moms and doing this. And now it's like, oh no, like they've always, it's always been this way, you know? Mm. I mean, that's, I don't know. That's like a five or six year span that just seems super hard and dark for you. Yeah. Yeah. It was very dark. From the beginning of your mission Basically on. To this point in the story. Yeah. yeah. It was very, I don't know, like, I feel like getting married, like, at least I found, like, somebody who I loved. But then even that, like, I feel like once I started getting this resentment towards the church, like, that was also hard on our marriage, right? Because I felt like, um, I felt like my husband didn't understand like how shitty this was for me, (laughs) you know, like it felt like, I don't know. Like it just felt like, why was I so ungrateful? Like I came from a great family. And again, I didn't have the language to be able to have this conversation of like what's going on in my mind and like how I got 
to like actually hating the thing that I pushed so hard for us to have, you know? Mm. Cause you wanted it. You thought you wanted it. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, is this not happiness? Like, no, all I wanted to do was just work. I wanted to get out of the house, um, and do hair. And like, I enjoyed doing that, you know, at the time, but I felt like just trapped. I don't know. And a lot of times people will say that, like, you know how there's like a lot of Mormon women influencers on and they'll be like, it's because they love journaling. I'm like, no, it's because that's their out. That's finally how they got out. They dug their whole their canal to the ocean. They were fish too big for the pond, you know, and that's how they got out. And now they can now they have the money to afford the child care that they desperately wanted you know, now they have the, the means to be able to have a reason why they need to go out with friends and do these things, you know. Um, I think it, that is why there's a lot of Mormon women influencers is because they're operating within the system still, you, you know. They had to create their own. Yeah. I, I'd love to make an observation if it's okay. Yeah. We had cult expert Stephen Hassan here, and he talks a lot about this idea of a, assuming the cult personality. And this isn't me calling the Mormon church a cult just for those who are believing Mormons. But I think this the, the concept applies that we have, uh, we have our personality, we have our values, and our tastes and preferences and our personalities that we kind of come with mm -hmm. from birth. Yeah. It's kind of who we are. And in your case, from what I've heard in your story, you were big, you were strong, you liked to have fun, mm -hmm. you like to explore, you're adventurous, you were sexual, you were a sexual being in, in certain ways. Yeah. Um, you believed, you, you weren't naturally wired to have babies, but you are naturally wired to want to have a career and a profession like, and you believe in equality and social justice and, and those sorts of things. That's who you are. Mm -hmm. But then the whole way in your Mormon experience, you're being told, no, 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 you're none of those things. You're small, you're quiet. You need to keep to yourselves. Mm -hmm. Don't be sexual. Don't be big. Don't be strong. Don't be loud. Don't want uh, education. Don't pursue a career. Mm -hmm. You do want babies. And it's it's like there these there's these two levels of who you are and the mold that the church is trying to cram you into to the point where y you are super depressed and 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 um, unhealthy. Is that yeah. fair? Oh, absolutely. It was literally like the exact opposite of what I naturally would want to well, do. I forgot white, white and delights. Yeah, you know, you yeah. it's literally opposite <laughs> of everything that I am. Yeah. Um, like the church is trying to make you as white as possible, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think maybe that is, maybe that is like a dream of like white women to like, you know, be at home. But like in the 50s, when white women were wanting that dream, black women were their maids and their caregivers for their children, you know? So maybe it was never meant to be in me <laughs> to just be at home. Like for generations, my ancestors have been working and caring for their families, you know? And it doesn't look the same as how I was raised, you know? Mm. It's like complete opposite. Yeah. I think it's interesting because this idea of the split self, it feels like it emerged earlier in your story. Like mm -hmm. we identified it, but it just seems like the more experiences you had, mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like the bigger it got and the more split it got. Yeah. So the tension and then the mental health repercussions of holding both of them at the same time. Yeah. Would you say that, that it, it just got uh, more and more intense and the cost got higher and higher? Yeah, because at this point when I'm feeling like I just want to run away and be free, I have a child, you know, like I can't regress. I can't go back, 
you know, or when I want things to just slow down with life, again, a child like just adds so much complexity and speed to your life, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I start still having, I don't know, like the panic attacks that I was having were like off and on until we moved out. We finally got a house in Harriman. We bought our first townhouse. Um, and I still like in my head, I was thinking like, oh, if we can just get a house, like that's probably like, like living with my mother-in-law, that's like why I'm feeling this way. You know, let's just get a house and that will make things better. And it didn't, it made things worse because now I had less help with my mm -hmm. kid and I was having more panic attacks like that. I just was like, like I end up not even be able to go to the store anymore. I couldn't even go grocery shopping. I was so overwhelmed just mentally. Like it was too much. You're uh, also more isolated, right? That's true. Yeah. Because now I didn't have my mother-in-law and like across the street was my husband's um, aunt's next door was his other aunt, you know? Mm, wow. So yeah, I was definitely more isolated because and I didn't know how not to be. You yeah. know, um, I just like if I wasn't at work, I was just inside all day. Now, sometimes the Mormon Relief Society, the women's organization in your local congregation or ward mm -hmm. would be your support system and your friends. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't my experience. <laughs> um, I just didn't really connect. Like, it's easy for me to be extroverted and just like. Like know a lot of people, it's not easy for me to have deep, meaningful connections with people. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it was just, it was weird. Like that, that ward was so big and everyone was like our age. So you'd think it would be like the time of your life, right? Like everyone's our age, everyone has kids our age. Um, but I just felt so other, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like the conversations that they would have. I was just like, like, oh, this is how I lost my baby weight. Like, I just didn't eat anything during the day. And then you can have as much ice cream as you want at night. Yes. And I was just like, that's an eating disorder. Like, <laughs> yes. that's not like. Something to brag about. Yeah. And like the conversations I was wanting to have was how much I hated being a stay at home mom. <laughs> and these women apparently love it. Like, I don't know. Like. It just was not, I don't, there was just so much of me that felt so other, yeah. you know, um, that I just felt like it was too hard to like maintain these relationships to get to know people on a deeper level. Everything was very superficial. Yeah. Hmm. Dang. So how did you make it out of this? I know. Well, I ended up going to my bishop and telling him I needed to go to a counselor. Um, so he recommended me to LDS social services and that didn't go well either. <laughs> um, it wasn't really counseling. Like so much of it was focused on how do I like church? How am I reading my scriptures that I think like, I don't think, how do I put this? I think that you are allowed to be a therapist of any religion, right? And it informs how, how you relate to your clients, right? But when you are not upholding your ethical duties uh, to do no harm um, and focus on the problem at hand, that's where my issue comes in with it. Um because I think any good therapist instantly would have realized that I was at least suffering from anxiety and depression and want to get to the root of that instead of talking about scriptures and church. Um, yeah. So I only went like three times before I was like, I can't do this. Yeah. There, there is a conflict of interest if, if you're struggling with the Mormon church and they're recommending therapists that are only going to give you counsel that the church would like and support. Yeah. That'd be like 
you're having problems with your boss, but you can only see a therapist that your boss approves of. Yeah. You know, there's a conflict of- Or who your boss is talking to. That's right. Who will share <laughs> the, the yeah. things with the boss. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, and so just so many disasters have come mm -hmm. from Mormon church referred therapists. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it just didn't help me at all. After the third time, I was just like, I guess nothing's wrong with me. It's like, maybe I'm just making this up in my head. And then we ended up moving to Pocatello, Idaho, because my husband's husband got a job there. Um, and so at the time I thought, well, maybe that's my answer. Maybe I just need to be a stay a full time stay at home mom. Cause at first I was working part time and I thought, yeah, I'm tired. So maybe this is God's way of telling me it's time to be a stay at home mom full time. Um, so we moved to Idaho and things continued to get worse for me <laughs> before they got better. Um, I started, m my husband wanted another child. Um, my husband was an only child. And so he did not like being an only child and didn't want our son to be an only child as well. Um, and that was important to me too, to some degree. I just wasn't, I just knew I wasn't ready to have another child though. Um, and then we started dealing with um, infertility issues with, I just couldn't get pregnant. Um, mm -hmm. And so in Pocatello is where we found a fertility doctor. Um, and I found out that I had polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, which is just means that your hormones, you don't produce, produce enough, um, what would it be? Just your hormones are out of whack, right? So you're not creating like the egg that's supposed to come off your ovaries is not coming off. Um, and it's just creating cysts on your ovaries. Um, and so he found that out. And so you're not ovulating as well. So if you're not ovulating, you're not releasing a fertile egg to actually get pregnant. And the symptoms like are, there's a lot of pain associated with it, right? Do you have pain and bleeding and... Yeah. So for me, the symptoms were, I just didn't have a regular period. Okay. Um, so like, this is from the beginning of like, whenever I first had my period, it would come every six months, every three months, every nine months, every year, you know? Mm. So you're not having regular periods. Um, and then you're dealing with those cysts rupturing on your ovaries. So when I was on my mission, what had happened was all of those cysts were rupturing on my ovaries. Which are painful, right? Yeah, yeah. very painful. Yeah. Um, and they, they just didn't know as much as they did now at the time. And when those cysts rupture, it can cause scar tissue. So your ovaries don't like you just, this is how a lot of women become infertile completely because of that, you know? Um, and so for me, that's what was happening on my mission was just these are rupturing and I just can't no stop idea. bleeding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this doctor discovered that and I started taking medicine to be able to ovulate and to be able to make sure that the egg was actually coming off my ovaries um, to be able to get pregnant. Um, and then we started doing, so you're taking medicine to like hormones um, for all of this to happen. And then um, you're also, we were doing IUIs, which is inner utero insemination, where they stick a tube all the way up into your uterus and then your husband's semen is put into the tube so that you can get pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. yeah. Um, which it was awful. It was so painful for me um, to do those. I On the third time that we did it is when I got pregnant. Um, I don't know if it was from that actually or just naturally, you know, um, and I feel like prior to getting actual pregnant, like during all this time, 
I was experiencing just like crazy symptoms, um, which now I know is this PTSD. But at the time, I finally decided to go to a counselor. I was at my primary care physicians mm. getting just like a regular checkup. And I said, I need like a referral to a counselor um, because he had said to me, the primary care physician was like, well, I can prescribe you regular like depression medication. But if you think it's something more than that, you can go to a psychiatrist and do talk therapy and get prescribed medication. Um, so I did because the symptoms that I was experiencing at the time was just extreme paranoia. Um, anytime I, it was hard for me to leave my house in general, but when I did leave my house, it was just really scary for me. Like, and I'm not laughing cause it's like, funny but just because like looking back I'm just like wow that was so insane that I like thought this way I don't know yeah um were you so were you fearing for your safety when you left the house what things were you yeah, afraid of? yeah. I kept thinking that somebody was following me that somebody was trying to steal my son um and that, yeah, somebody was going to steal my son and or that I was going to be raped um, if I left. And and I had to leave my house frequently because at this time my son was having a speech delay. So he had to go to speech therapy like multiple times a week. Um, and it was just any time we'd go home, I'd take a different route home. It would t sometimes take us we're like 10 minutes away from the speech therapy place and it would take us 30 minutes to get home because I would just drive all, all around Pocatello feeling like somebody's following me and I have to lose, lose uh, them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. And then I started hearing voices. So at night I would stay up just like constantly being waking up in the middle of the night because I would think I was hearing somebody outside trying to break into our house or somebody in the basement or I'd go check in on my son um, because I just was like sure somebody was trying to steal him out of the window. It's so scary. Yeah. And so I just kept waking up doing that. Um, mm. This is sounding a little bit, I, I, I have a psychology uh, background. It's, it's sounding a little bit like obsessive compulsive disorder. And yeah. ruminations around safety. That that's the it's sounding a little bit like that. O yeah. O C D. Would you check? Like would you get up and do things to yeah. try and I would go and check on him and then I'd go back to bed. Um and then I would I don't know, I was just so Ugh. anxious and so um I didn't know what was going on. I did find out that like my brother also had bipolar disorder. And so when I did go to see a psychiatrist and they started going down the list of things of like, because I was experiencing it, it felt like mania because there would be some times where like I was just so depressed, like I couldn't even get mm -hmm. out of bed. And then there'd be other times where I just was like extreme anxiety, but I could like get a lot of stuff done in my house. And then I was also very paranoid of somebody being after me. Yeah. Um, constantly. And so it did at the time fit the description of mm -hmm. bipolar disorder. Um, and yeah. that like, and probably not sleeping. Yeah. I was not sleeping at all. During the mania. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, um, so I went to this counselor before I had actually gotten pregnant was telling them that I was in the process of trying to get pregnant and they were telling me maybe hold off on getting pregnant um, and like slow down, you know, but you know, you got to have another kid. You got to keep mm. adding to the Mormon line. Um, I think now looking back, it was PTSD coming up yeah. and it was just manifesting itself in paranoia and, you know, like genetically, bipolar throat goes through your genetics. And I think it was just like, that's what my body the rhythm manifested. Of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The trauma that was going on, um, was 
to have these what seemed like bipolar episodes. Wow. Um, yeah, I think I was very triggered to be getting pregnant again and not be ready to have another child. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And just my body's way of being like, no, yes. stop, you know? Yeah. So how did you, how did you work through this? <laughs> I know. It's like, here's another one. Well, yeah. Um, I got on medication, um, which somewhat I feel like helped in a way, like it helped for me to be able to start thinking more clearly and to actually sleep, right? And not hear um, voices. Because um, part of hearing those voices could have just been the lack of sleep, you know? Um, and so I think like any counselor, the first thing is to do is to monitor your sleep and see how much sleep you're actually getting at night. Um, and for me, I just was literally getting like three hours of sleep some nights, like, wow. and none of like deep sleep, you know? So I think first it was like getting rid of the sleep deprivation that was going on. Um, and then I was just in a lot of pain, you know, I would wake up every morning get my son breakfast. I would put on a show for him and go downstairs to our downstairs bathroom and just like wail, mm. just like scream and cry and just take a shower um, and just sit in the shower. And I did that every morning, just <laughs> in so much pain. Like, I just don't even know how to describe it. It was so physical for me, the pain. <laughs> Like, in my chest, in my heart, I just was wailing. Um, and then every night, my husband would get home, and I would go on a drive, and I'd go sit in front of... They were building the Pocatello Temple at the time, and I would just scream at God. <laughs> Because I just didn't know, like, what was wrong with me, you know? And so that's how I dealt with it for, like, a year <laughs> um, was just to go to counseling and just grin and bear it. <laughs> And then I was even the second counselor in the young women's presidency, too, <laughs> at the time. Uh, this is a lot of work. I, yeah. Yeah. It's exhausting. Cause, and I thought that maybe, like, doing that would, like, help me to, like, get out and, like, meet other people. It was hard, the area that we lived in, too, because, again, I just was not creating, like, deep, meaningful friendships. Like... And I would blame it on like, well, maybe it's just because like people here are older than us, you know, by like 15, 20 years older than us. Maybe that's why. Um, so then I finally, my counselor that I was seeing, um, he suggested that maybe I should go back to work. Maybe I should find a job in Pocatello because it sounds like that was, he said it sounded like something that I enjoyed um, and that maybe I still need that. Um, and he was, he was a really great counselor. Cause at the time too, I told him that I hated men <laughs> and he was a man and he took it like a champ. Like I feel like, and wasn't trying to convince me otherwise, you know, and was super helpful to like, ask questions for me to be able to figure myself out, which I think is the biggest thing with counseling is like, they're there for you to help to, for you to figure yourself out, not for them to figure you out, you know? Um, yeah. So I went back to work at a hair salon in Idaho falls and I met finally some really great friends. Um, I know you, um, what is her name? Cause uh, one of my friends, you interviewed her sister for the parrot 
is her last name, Sarah Parrott, is my friend. So you interviewed her husband. And Josh. Her, yeah. No? And she's Kim. Kim Coffin. There we go. Yes. Josh and Kim. Yes. yes. Sorry, Kim. Be- beautiful so, brain, people. Yeah. Brain burp. Yep. So Sarah was... Kim's sister. Kim's sister. Yeah. So I met her younger sister at the time, was 19 and working at this hair salon that I worked at. She was a nail artist. Um, and we started trading. I would do her hair and she would do my nails. And we started talking about church. I don't know. And Mormonism. And she was like, I, at the time I was 26 and she was 19. Um, and she was very much out of the church. Um, and so she would have, I don't know, she was just so blunt. Like when I would say like, yeah, but like the church is like good for my kids, you know, cause that's kind of what keeps you in sometimes is like, I, how will I raise my kids? And she's like, I don't think so. I think it messes them up. <laughs> and I was just like, whoa, like this is the first time I'm finally talking to someone who is having an actual conversation um, that's deeper than just like the script. This, Yeah. Everything's great. Yeah. You're it's like, true. Everything's true. It's like true. you're Everything's breaking great. through the veneer. Yes. And she just like was like, yeah, I don't think it's healthy at all um, for kids to be raised in it. I don't think it's great for women. I don't think <laughs> like it's great at all. And it's when that was kind of where I started to question as well. Like, is this really great for me? Um, because Isn't it weird it can be in some ways toxic for you for so many years? Yeah. And yet you reach age 25 of at least five, six straight years of toxic misery. Yeah. And you never allowed yourself to even consider that it might be unhealthy. What, what that it was that, not you. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was fully <laughs> convinced that like, I just needed to read my scriptures more <laughs> and do this more. <laughs> the thing that was killing yeah, you. Yeah. That's literally drink more of the toxic yeah. poison. Basically. I'm just like more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't until somebody, but this is also the first time I've literally had anybody have a different opinion than it is good for you. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like I could describe this everything to a regular Mormon um, and they would just be like, yeah, like life's hard. Thank heavens we have the church, you know? Um, so yeah, it just was not until somebody brought it to my attention and then I started making other friends at this same hair salon um, and another one of my friends, um, Lena, um, another person who had left the church, you know, and, or was in the process and like, same thing, like was talk, we were able to have conversations about hard things that had happened to us, um, and like validate one another, <laughs> um, and not just like keep going with the status quo, Um, and they introduced me to a podcast called not so Molly Mormon, um, which was super helpful at the time. And then that later introduced me, they had mentioned Mormon stories podcasts on that podcast. Um, because I had driven all the way literally from like Rexburg all the way to Warham and seen the Mormon stories billboards But I always thought it was a faith affirming podcast. So I'd flip it off or yell at it every time (laughs) I pass by. (laughs) Um, So so the marketing on that was, didn't work. You're like, (laughs) I've lived some Mormon stories. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize though what it was at the time. Yeah. You thought it was probably. Yeah. I was like, why would I list? Because it it said like faith crisis, like on it at the time. And I was just like, oh. Uh, yeah. And I thought it was like an affirming to like keep you in. <laughs> and I was like, absolutely not. Um, so I finally listened to it. I think it was the Tom Phillips. Whoa, you started with Tom Phillips. Yeah. Because <laughs> they had mentioned it on the not so 
Molly Mormon podcast, like that, that episode was insane. And so I was like, for those who don't know, that's the episode about the second anointing about yeah. a, a British man who received a second anointing and then lost his faith after. Yeah. And if you don't know second anointing it is, go listen to the Tom Phillips podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would blow your mind. It did blow my mind and it made me angry. Why? I hated the wife washing the feet. Yeah. That was like so triggering to me of like... In the second anointing, the wife washes the husband's feet. Is it twice? Yeah, I think. Mm. Or... Mm. No, or he washes her feet after she washes his. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Either way, it was like that episode, like, you know, like in the Bible where like... She she blesses him after she washes his feet Mm -hmm. in their special room. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's supposed to like, you know how like, it wasn't Mary that washed Jesus' feet with her tears? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's in similitude of Mary washing Jesus' feet. Yeah. Yeah. And even that. And that's the highest ordinance of Mormonism is a woman washing washing a man's feet. feet, Right? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And so that just made me really upset. And then I started listening to Year of Polygamy. Um. I can't remember if it was a Mormon stories or year of polygamy where you talk about a chapter 132. Um, We definitely have several episodes on DNC 132. Yeah. 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 And so, but of what it actually means. And when I first listened to that, to realize that I had covenanted to plural marriage, I was at the gym and I just, I couldn't stop throwing up. Like I literally ran into the bathroom and was just throwing up. Literally? Yeah. Hmm. Because again, I still believed it. Right. Hmm. And so I still was like, I've already covenanted to plural marriage without knowing. Yeah. Because the new and everlasting covenant as outlined in DNC 132 involves plural marriage with one man and multiple women. That's just a fact. Any Mormon who denies that hasn't read their scriptures. And when you get sealed, you are sealed in the new and everlasting covenant. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Yeah. And so when I put that together, I was like sick because again, I'm still already dealing with all this anxiety around it. And now I'm like struggling with With polygamy in general, and now it's like I've already said that I will be polygamist unknowingly, (laughs) Mm. was a lot to to take in. I don't know, to deal with. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so I just started on a Mormon Stories rampage. Binge. Yeah. (laughs) Rabbit hole. (laughs) Yeah. And started reading... The gospel topic essays, um, and then, I don't know, even the, I was still trying so hard to be faithful, um, until all of the sudden I went to the release, general release society meeting and I just was like, please like God send something in this to like keep me here because I just cannot keep doing this anymore. Um, and at the end when president Nelson talked, it made me just in a full on rage. I was so angry that he was talking about motherhood as if he knew anything about motherhood. I, since when can a penis give birth? Like it made me so mad. And that was like, When I was like, I can't do it anymore. Like, I'm not going to sit here my whole life. I have been told what womanhood is from a man. And I can't do it anymore. Um, And it doesn't work for me because this is not womanhood. This is your idea of what womanhood is. And you've never stopped to listen to a woman on what actual womanhood is. Um... So I, yeah, I just was kind of, I was still in the Young Women's Presidency, but it was during 2020. So we all got, got that time off. Um, and I was... Is that COVID? COVID, okay. yeah. Um, and so I was still seeing a counselor and 
I just was like working through all of this, all of the, I don't know, just all of everything that happened to me, you know, um, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and it's just, it's not working for me. So when we started to go back to church, I had, I can't remember if I had, I think I had already given birth to my second child. Um, and at the time I was trying really hard. I thought I would be Christian. Um, and so even my second child's name is Judah because I was like, he needs a strong biblical name. (laughs) Um, and now that's going to live on forever (laughs) cause he is named, um, I tried really hard to be Christian. I thought I can just be Christian, you know? And then I read Allison, what's her last name? It's called The Making of Biblical Womanhood. Mm. Um, Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. A year of living? No, I'll look it up. Um, I know what you were talking about. A Making of Women, Womanhood. Of biblical womanhood is okay. what it's called. Oh yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, and so it's by a evangelical mm. author, a woman, Beth Allison Barr. Yes. Um, the making of biblical womanhood: how the subjugation of women became gospel truth. Yeah, that sounds intense. Yeah, mm-hmm. and healthy. <laughs> yeah, and so she is an evangelical. Christian, right? And reading that book like made it so I couldn't even go to Christianity, right? Because I was like, oh, it's all the same. Right. Like just a different um, mm-hmm. brand, you know? Um, and then I thought I'm. it may be better just not to to have to be religious at all. So I went to my bishop and I asked to be released from the young woman's presidency. Um, yeah. Cause I just was like, I can't do this anymore. Like when we had to go back to in-person church, I just like literally could not, like it was hard for me to even go to a meeting, a young women's meeting, like with just the presidency in the church building. Like it was like, I couldn't even be in the church building. It was so overwhelming to me. Um, and so, yeah, I had to ask to be released and I just, I literally didn't go back to church after. And I told my husband that I needed to take a break. Um, and that I don't, I didn't know if I could be Mormon anymore. Um, which was hard. Like, I think like, His reaction, I think, is normal to how everyone reacts, right? He was like, how are you breaking this, like, commitment that we made, right? And, like, in the temple, it's, like, even bigger because it's, like, a covenant that you made. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really thought that he was going to divorce me. Like, I had a plan in my head that, like, I would move in with my parents and take care of our kids and we would be divorced. Like that's really what I thought that he would <laughs> leave me. Um, but he didn't and he just said, okay, like, yeah, we'll get through it. Um, and I think at that point, you know, I think he had been in denial about my mental state um, throughout our marriage. And I think for him, he just was kind of like, whatever helps you feel better, you know, cause it was just prioritize you. Yeah. Cause at that point he like every single day we'd have a conversation and I would be just talking about how miserable it is to be a stay at home mom. And he would be like, what do you just like want to leave us? Like, And yeah, a lot of days I did. I was just really miserable. Um, And so I decided to not go to church anymore. Our youngest was blessed just in our home with some family. Um, 
He wasn't recorded though on, you know how they record the like. Like a children of record. Yes. Yeah. So, which I thought was nice. Like the ward clerk at the time, I didn't know how he knew. I was like, probably everyone knew though. Cause I asked to be released from <laughs> young women's, mm -hmm. but he had just said, he had asked me if I wanted him to be recorded like the baby blessing. And I said, no, I don't right now. Um, and he, I don't know. I don't know. Everyone at that point tries to just like get you back converted, you know, cause he like was trying it over the phone. He was just said like, yeah, well you should still write down like your baby's blessing. Like I grew up Catholic, so I never had the opportunity to get a father's blessing and so like you should still write it down so he has that forever and I just was like yeah I was like I know how you feel because I've never had a mother's blessing either <laughs> and he just was like yeah and uh, we hung up the phone <laughs> yeah <laughs> an answer he didn't expect <laughs> yeah <laughs> um mm. Because it just, I don't know, at that point, I really felt a lot of anger towards the church. I was angry that we, I really didn't want to do the baby blessing. I was angry that there was no rituals for women specifically in the church, right? And yeah. even if they created just like, I don't know, some ditzy, who cares what, that would keep so many women there if they just had a specific, crumb. yeah. A crumb, a crumb of a, a ritual. Yeah. Hmm. But again, it's like I go through all of this work of creating this child, of birthing this child, and I have no no yeah. rituals for myself. Can't even hold the baby in the circle. Yeah. Can't do anything. Yeah. And I should just be grateful, right, that it's that would be too much work for me to have the priesthood. And at that point, it wasn't even that I wanted the priesthood. It's just, I wanted, I wanted to truly be recognized for my contributions to the world, to the church, right? Um, because it has been downplayed so much of my contributions. Like this congregation would not even be without the women here because we literally birthed every single member of this congregation, you know? Um, yeah, so I think a lot of it at first was just I had a lot of anger um, yeah. towards the church and towards this idea of womanhood, right? I think even women now in the church— like you really are constructed out of the view from a man's view of what it is to be a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and maybe a lot like it, maybe a lot like being stay at home moms. I didn't, it wasn't for me. Um, and I don't know how many will continue to like it as inflation gets worse um, because it costs a lot of money to yeah. only have a, a one income household now. I don't know how people survive off of it because we, mm, I guess we were okay, you know? Um, but yeah, just at that point, it the more I stepped away, the better I felt. Yeah. And yeah. back to the idea of working, you know, yeah, economic reasons are one reason. Yeah. But... Also mental health. Yeah. That's all. And actually not even, like we could say not even mental health, but desires enough. Yeah. As a woman, it's enough to want to. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's like, we are not, it's not your mother's society anymore, you know? Um, yeah, I don't think that it's, you have to, you have to work just cause to make money. Like you can work just cause you like it, you know? Um, 
Yeah, and it was a huge leap because after we moved to Pocatello, my husband ended up getting a job in um, Virginia, rest in Virginia, the D.C. area. Um, so we moved again. <laughs> so we just keep moving. Um, and that was always hard for me, right? The expectation of you will just move wherever your husband has work um, was really, really hard for me. Um, and moving to Pocatello, I felt like I was like, again, I thought it was like, I'm doing this for like, cause this is what God wants me to do, you know? Um, which I shouldn't, I don't think, I don't think that's a good enough reason to do something <laughs> anymore. I don't think it's a good enough reason that God wants you to, um, to do something. Well, some man says God wants you to, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, like you said, in the temple, there's a connection between them. Yeah. So yes, your husband says he wants to, and then you connect it to God because that's the association that you've been, yeah. those two are linked. Yeah. And I think when you come from like, like when we had our first kid, like we were literally on food stamps, living in his mom's basement, you know? So like you you kind of like quickly go from like living a fine life to like now you feel impoverished, you know? Um, and so like it feels like you need to follow the money um, to be able to like enjoy life. And maybe that's how I felt for a long time is like, oh, if we just had more money, then maybe I wouldn't feel this way. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's like even now I feel like we have less money and I feel less depressed, you know, mm -hmm. it yeah. had nothing to do with the money. Yeah. So can I, I want to go back to something you said that for me was maybe one of the most powerful things of the whole interview. You said that, and I'm just going to read it back. The more I stepped away, the better I felt. Now in, in, in the Mormon church, there's the teaching that wickedness never was happiness. Yeah. And there's the teaching that you know, the, the ultimate calling of a woman is a wife and mother, mm -hmm. that the woman's place is in the home, that it's the, it's the plan of not just salvation, but the great plan of happiness. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what you're saying is, is the more you got into Mormonism from your mission to temple marriage, to motherhood, wifehood, the more toxic and, and I would just say deadly it was becoming for you. Yeah. Talk us through how the, what you mean by the farther you got away from it, the healthier and happier you got. Can you talk us through that? Yeah. Well, first I would say whose happiness, because I think Mormonism is the plan of happiness for men. <laughs> um, white, white men, yeah. white, white straight men. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I loved Mormonism yeah. in so many ways. You were very happy because all the support was for you. It was made right? by and for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you had your wife to support you. Yeah. You had the children you wanted. You may not have had to work very hard to actually take care of the children day to day. Right. Because that was your wife's job. So I would say it in that regard, it is the plan of happiness for a lot of men because the world revolves around them. Um, for women and for me, I had to step out of this male centric world um, and I can no longer orbit around men anymore to support their happiness because it was not supporting my happiness at all. Um, and so the further I stepped away from Mormonism and the ideals of this is what makes a good wife, this is what makes a good woman, instead of figuring out what is, what do I think, I'm the woman, what makes a good woman? What do I think makes a good woman? What do yes. I think makes a good wife? What do I think makes a good mother? Um, and I, I don't know, like especially... It was hard for me to feel abandoned by my biological parents um, and then to feel like this religion was also making me invis invisible and almost like another abandoning 
because I was not really seen. Um, and how I viewed the world was not really cared about. You were taught to abandon yourself. Yeah. That's probably the biggest thing is, yeah, the self-abandonment. Yeah. Yeah. And in addition to the wanting to leave the men, you know, orbiting the man, mm -hmm. there's the messages around what whiteness means, mm -hmm. what blackness means, what beauty is and what beauty isn't. Mm, yeah. What personality you should have. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I feel like um, moving across the country to D.C. was like the best thing we ever did because I finally just got to be. Um, I could just like when you in in D.C., there's all different types of way to be a woman. There's all different types of way to be a man and there's going to be all different types of color of those people and there's so many different religions you know um so even if somebody is a certain religion when you get to know them that's not like the main thing they're even talking about you know because that's just like so so many people are so many different religions that it's like that's so far from something that you're connecting with someone on, you know? It's the salt, not the meal. Right? Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so when I moved to D.C. is when I finally felt like, I don't know, like when I was listening to Heather Gay's episode of Mormon Stories, that episode like blew my mind because I was like, why do I relate to like a 45 year old woman, a white woman? <laughs> like, why do I relate so much to her when, how do I have the same experience as her? And I'm, I'm not white. Like, I don't know. It's so it really put me on this journey to like find out what it means to me to be a woman find out what it means to me to be a black woman and to not continue to deny these things that were hard for me, right? Like I kept feeling like if somebody else doesn't believe that it's hard, then it must have not been a hard thing instead of finding myself and being like, that was really hard for me. It may not seem like it was a hard thing to go through, but like for me, it just was. And finding that self-confidence again to just be secure in myself. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of like when you've talked about feeling invisible, making yourself visible to yourself. Mm -hmm. And then from there to the people around you, like refusing to be invisible. Yeah. And then also like with abandonment, feeling this sense of, being abandoned and finding yourself. Exactly. And then from there, you can look to find the right people to yeah. love that won't abandon you. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. And I didn't want to be like, like my sons, I did not want them to feel like this is is okay. Like, I didn't want to be the, you know how they're like, President so-and-so's wife passed away. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to just be President so-and-so's wife anymore. It wasn't good enough for me anymore. It wasn't good enough to just be the bishop's wife anymore. It wasn't good enough to just be the stake president's wife anymore. I wanted people, and I still do, want people to know Tara right not the wife of this someone, the mother of this someone, know me. Um, and I want my sons to know me, not just this version of, I don't know, through the Mormon lens, me. The Truman Show character. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I feel like I, I have friends that are still religious, still Christian, and I started working once I got to D.C. and getting childcare. I feel like 
I feel like you just can't knock it until you try it, <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, Cause a lot of people's excuses for not having childcare will be like, well, it would be my whole paycheck. And maybe for now it would be, um, but that's part of working, right? You work your way up. So it isn't your whole paycheck. Um, right. It's like growing a career. Right? Yeah. And even if it is your whole paycheck and you enjoy what you're doing, mm-hmm. then yeah. keep doing it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I feel like I met friends who have just become such great friends to me um, that aren't, have never been Mormon, you know. <laughs> um, I feel like what's most interesting about Mormonism, it's more interesting to people who have never been Mormon than who have. Um, so it's fun to, like, talk to them about their experience or even talking to somebody who's gay and has like a, a healthy upbringing. It's kind of like, what's that like? Like, I didn't know that was possible. Like to have affirming parents, you know, that don't care about what sexuality you are. Um, yeah. And I think like when Mormonism fell for me, everything kind of fell Um, and I don't really, I would say now I probably closely resemble an atheist. I wouldn't say even agnostic. Um, and that's just personal. I don't know. Like now for me, I can't see, there's no religion out there that I feel like doesn't revolve around men Um, and specifically, I feel like even in the United States, I don't know if there's a religion out there that has ever not been racist or born in, in racism, you know, Mm -hmm. um, if there is, I'm still not interested in joining. Like, I just, I don't know. I think religion can be a defense mechanism, right. And a safety net. And I also think not being religious can be that as well you know and for me it's just it's too much yeah um to have to be religious or spiritual or anything anymore you know yeah. and just healthy or not to be <laughs> mm. and so for those who are like well you you were you were going through panic attacks bipolar symptoms paranoia depression anxiety you were having physical manifestations of sort of a breakdown. Mm -hmm. What's happened to all of that? Um, yeah. So I don't have panic attacks anymore. I don't have, I don't even take medication anymore. Paranoia? No, don't have paranoia. Um, I still can get regular anxiety, And that's just what it is, right, is I don't know if it's, like, as intense anxiety as I used to get. Before, I used to, like, count every bad thing I did in a day um, before I'd go to bed. (laughs) I'd keep track of every sin I ever did. Um, And I just don't – I don't know. I don't feel that way at all anymore. Um, I still – I'm working through the grief, I feel like, of now, since I don't believe in an afterlife, I don't believe that I'll ever see or meet my biological father. Um, Yeah, so working through that, I still am trying to navigate the relationship with my biological family in general. And there's a lot of grief and pain still there, but at least I can just name the emotions. It's not something that really consumes me anymore. It just is right. And maybe it will be like that forever. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. You mentioned reparenting in your rebuilding as well. Do you want to talk a minute about what it means to you to reparent yourself and parent in a different way? Yeah. 
I think the biggest thing is doing things, um, <coughs> sorry, that, I don't know, like, I feel like now, like, I'm not afraid to learn about just how, if I have questions around sex, like, to Google it and figure it out and, like, actually have that conversation with my husband, um, and with parenting my kids now, um, I think we all parent from a place of like wanting to give our kids the things that we didn't have, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and with my kids now, it's like, I just want them to know that they have options. Right. Um, cause Mormonism for me, felt like I had, these were my only options. Right. I could either like burn in hell or right. follow the Mormon path, you know? Um, and even with my husband and I getting married, right? Our two options were either wait a year to have sex or get married civilly when there was a third option. Right. Right. Like we could have right. still waited to get married and still slept together, you know? That's right. And still dated. Um, and so I think just knowing that there's, there's always other options when I parent and not wanting to parent out of a place of that extreme fear. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I just don't want to be, I am, a, I get afraid, right? I don't want my kids to get hurt just like every other parent um, physically, mentally, but I also am aware of kids get hurt, you know, and I'm just have to be mentally strong enough for them as well, you know, um, because they need it. They're probably going to come to me one day and tell me things that I did wrong as a parent and that they're angry at. And I think now is the time to prepare myself mentally to be able to have those tough conversations as they grow up, you know? Right. Um, That's and it's really okay. big. Yeah. And it's okay to like, for me going to therapy and being like, this person failed me. I failed myself here. Um, this person failed me. It's like, sometimes there's not going to be any accountability, right? I don't expect any accountability from the Mormon church. I don't expect anybody yeah. to take responsibility for it. Um, but it's okay to still say that you failed me. Um, and that in times I failed myself, you know? Yeah. 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 How has it been, you know, one of the themes I feel like that has come up throughout your story are hard conversations and communicating. Mm -hmm. um, and those conversations as a parent that, you know, you would want to have yeah. with your kids. How has it been so far, you know, taking that on? Because you're, you're basically making a new blueprint. Yeah. You're doing something new, right? Yeah. You're not using something that you received. So in that, how has that been for you? Has it felt hard? Has it felt healing? Like what has it been like so far with desiring to have more open communication and direct conversation? Yeah. I think what I've started is with having those conversations with my husband, um, of being able to, I don't know, just voice like, I don't even like I'm now 29 years old and I still feel awkward sometimes talking to my husband about sex. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I feel like it's like I need to be able to have these hard conversations for us together so that we can in turn have these hard conversations with our kids. Um, I will say with my kids now, I feel like it's been easy to talk about like just knowing atomically correct language for different body parts. It's real. I feel like I'm at a really easy place with my kids mm. um, because I don't have to, they're not old enough yet, you know, to like get into really 
deep conversations regarding sexuality and those type of things. Um, but I feel like right now it's like trying to have those conversations, even though I may feel uncomfortable or silly, um, to have them with my husband, you know, and being able to be like, how are we going to raise our kids? Cause my husband is still, um, still attends. Right. So we're still a part member family. Um, and so I think it starts with like being able to have those conversations with each other. Right. Before we start having those conversations with our kids. Yeah. Cause yep. it's a lot. So <clears throat> something that a Mormon brain won't be able to understand is the idea that not only can you be happier mm -hmm. as a working mom, but you can actually be a better mom mm -hmm. as a working mom. Mm -hmm. Can you address that? Yeah, I feel like, um, well, to me, happiness is subjective, first of all. So it may not work for other people. You may be miserable doing it. So I don't know. For me, it works because it's what I want to do. I like making money. I like being able to work towards a common goal financially with my husband, you know, and I like being feeling like I have the power to contribute, right? Like, I, there's nothing more, I don't know, like damaging than when we go to buy a car and because I don't have a job, because I don't have any credit, um, I can't do that. You know, it's scary. It's a scary feeling when you're like a naturally anxious person to leave your life in somebody else's hands, literally. Um, and especially because I was an able-bodied, I don't know if I'm I semi-smart person, <laughs> like, you know, like Very. I I can I can mm -hmm. work, you know, I can work and make this less stressful for the two of us, you know, if we both work and being able to send my kids to daycare, like I I think a lot of times men don't realize, right? Like when they go to work and somebody's watching, their wife is watching their kids, they make a doctor's appointment and they just go during their lunch break, right? They don't even have to think about like who's going to watch their kids. When I became a mom, I've never been more stressed out than having to figure out what to do with my kids and why I never realized how many appointments we go to. <laughs> in a week, in a day where you can't have your kids there. This is valid. Yeah. This is real. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's nice to be able to be like, now I can go to an appointment when I need to go to an appointment. That's right. And I already have childcare um, taken care of. Um, and my husband really likes the childcare too. Like that was something, you know, we were taught that like children need to be raised by their mother like, that's the best possible place for a child to be is at home with their mom. And I think, yeah, sometimes that's true. Um, other times, I there's times where I feel like my daycare provider truly loves my kids more than I do because she's so patient and so kind, you know. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't have that in me to do that all day. Um and it's, I don't know, it helps mentally to be able to focus on just one thing at a time. You know, kids are hard and I, I don't think we we're meant to do it alone um, at all. And I don't know where, I, I think even in Mormonism, the community for me has not been how it was when I was a child um, for that support. I didn't get that support. I feel like within Mormonism was kind of. As a Mormon mom, you didn't get the word support. You thought. No, yeah. not like how when I was a kid, right? Where like where you had your friends who you knew you could drop your kids off to babysit 
Um, it just wasn't, it wasn't like that for me. And I don't know if that's just how it is now or if that genuinely. I mean, religions in free fall in the United States and Mormonism's in free fall in the United States. Yeah. They're both true. Yeah. It's not just a Mormon problem, but it certainly is a Mormon problem. Yeah. So I just, I didn't feel that. I think that was made it easier to walk away, you know, because I didn't feel a lot of support when it came to community um, within Mormonism. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm so happy you got well. Yeah. And I'm so inspired by your healing because you, you have had to heal and none of us are ever fully healed, but you have had to work through Mm -hmm. multiple levels of things that we've never had. None of us could even relate to Mm. because it's levels of complexity we just have never experienced and yeah. you know, we've had layer upon layer upon layer. That's right. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is the language, right? As soon as I realized what PTSD actually was. Or patriarchy or, or patri- systemic or racism, yeah. right? Or yeah. sexism. Um, to me, I don't know how somebody would be able to convince me that Mormonism isn't sexist. Like it's how it operates. You could not go and stand as a regular business and operate how it operates, right? You would be f- fined and in trouble if this was an actual yeah. regular business. But this is a church, it's yeah, okay. Yeah, they can do whatever they want, <laughs> um, which, okay. And so, yeah, Can you imagine a Fortune 500 company where women couldn't be executives? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have a penis. Yeah. Like if or like did. hold any of the management, only only staff workers, no, yeah. no management positions. Yeah. And I don't think like for women, right, like a lot of the argument would be like, well, I don't want to take on more work. But the thing that you fail to realize is like you don't even know the inner workings of how your church works. Right. For because you're not in those meetings, you don't even understand like how decisions get made, how any of this works and the argument that like, oh, you can only one person can be in charge. That's a lie. Lots of companies have boards of directors. There's multiple people constantly in charge um, to run successful businesses, successful marriages. Society is run with multiple people in charge all the time, you know, to get things done. Yeah. Um, and if it's, I don't understand the simplicity of like, well, somebody has to make the decision. It's like, yeah, we all make the decision, right? It's not just a one or the other, um, decision making. Yeah. All right. I have a question for you around, um, I feel like Mormonism paints a pretty clear picture, um, about what happens when you leave. Mm -hmm. So what has surprised you um, about where you find yourself today? Yeah, I think that I've all, I think my anxiety about what happens to me after I die was created because I feel more comfortable not knowing and, and not even believing that anything happens to me after I die than I did knowing that I was just going to be an, inter- an eternal baby maker, yeah. you know? Um, so I think sometimes people may be afraid to not have the answers when it actually feels better not to um, because the possibilities are better. It's yeah. not just... So yeah. narrow minded and narrow, narrowly scoped, you know, yeah. um, because now the possibilities are endless. Like some days I'm like, yeah, maybe it would be nice to have an afterlife. And some days are still really hard. And I think maybe it would be nice to just not once you die, you just get to rest forever, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah, it feels better to open that up more Um, because when I was at the height 
um, of Mormonism as well. Like nothing could soothe how the pain of like, like it didn't feel good either way. Like even when I was contemplating like wanting to take my own life, it felt horrible to even want to do that because I was like, well, then I'm going to be stuck still taking care of kids, still doing this. Like, it's like there There's was no, no freedom. In yeah. That. yeah. No freedom at all. Oh, uh, that's really, that's really something. Yeah. Um, okay. So another thing I'm curious about is in the rebuilding part, mm. the rebuilding phase, is there something that you feel particularly proud of? Um, I think the biggest thing I feel proud of is having no college education and having a job where I make just as much money as my friends who are my same age with a college education. Mm. Um, I feel like that's the biggest thing that yeah. I'm proud of because... I don't know. Like I just, I found a way somehow to scam some company into letting me work for them <laughs> um, and for them to pay me, you know, and it feels good to be paid for what I paid to do on a more remission. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, just, I don't know. And I feel proud that I've let go of the expectations of my children of how that who they have to be and how they have yeah, to show up right um, makes it so much easier to lift that like parenting is still hard right I still it's still hard for mm -hmm. me but now that I don't have that expectation the expectation is just like show me who you are um and don't hit like, yeah, it just like simple has simplified parenting for me to not have to be so overwhelmed with like, you need to sit still during church and you need to be able to know how to say your prayers and you need to be able to like start mm -hmm. learning scriptures and scripture mastery. Like, it's like, no, just be, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <sighs> wow. What a powerful, empowering story. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I hope everyone listens to this, um, just because it's such a s epic story of, of, um, I don't, don't want to say suffering, but like of, um, uh, oppression or abuse or, I mean, it's, it's on the one hand, <sighs> sorry, I'm just gathering my thoughts. Like. I know that it's complicated because you were able to meet your biological family and see that they're doing quite well mm -hmm. and, and that you did experience a lot of fraught education or lack of education and or oppression to some degree you didn't even know about from your Mormon upbringing. Mm -hmm. But I guess, I guess I would ask, um, do you feel, do you feel like you're at peace with the fact that your parents adopted you and that you're, you were raised Mormon from the standpoint of like, that's what got me to where I am and I've learned great things from it? Or mm. do you feel still anger and frustration and resentment at the Mormon experience you had? Or do you even know yet? Yeah. Or I both. And yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it depends on the day, right? Like some days I feel really proud of where I've gotten myself and other days it still feels hard because I still don't have a very strong relationship with my biological family. Um, and I still feel very conflicted, right? I still feel... Yeah. Like it's hard for me to talk with to them without feeling loss. jealous of my brothers. Yes. Yeah. And loss and pain and grief. 
And then there's other days where I feel like this is great. Like I get to have both worlds. Um, so it goes in between, I think. I don't know if I'll forever be on the roller coaster of just grieving and I don't know. Like there's some days where I really feel like, well, Mormonism wasn't that bad. Um, and there's other days where I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is still ruining my life. Mm -hmm. Like I can't work through this. How is this still a thing? Um, I don't know. It's just, it's both yeah. still, it's still both. Yeah. 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 I think there is like a, I don't know. It can feel alluring to have things have a neat closure or, you know, I think we're drawn to that. I think our brains like want it prefer to. that, yeah. you know, but yeah. I just feel like, I don't know. I feel like I'm bearing a testimony, but like, <laughs> like the more I'm alive, the more opposing things are true Yeah. at the same time, the more conflicting things can be true. The more there's like ebbs and flows and feelings, Yeah. Um, depending on the moment, depending on, you know, the day. So that feels like a very real answer, a very relatable <laughs> yeah. way of looking at something that it's complicated. Yeah. How could it not be? And I feel like that's like, for me, probably what was so hard in Mormonism is like, they're like, life's not complicated. Just follow the plan of happiness. And to my life, there's been nothing but complexity, yes. you know, and I've needed to be able to hold all of those emotions and all of the complexity. And I hope that's like what my sons understand, that there's nothing easy like life is supposed to be complicated right I don't know if it's supposed to be but it is complicated right and like people who try and act like well we're gonna confuse the children we're gonna confuse them it's like we're all confused I'm confused daily so I don't mm -hmm. know if like trying to like not make it confusing is even helping because right it's we're confused like there's a lot of complicated things life's hard and we all hold a lot of different things that is just don't make sense, you know, but that's just life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess what I was trying to articulate or process is just how much you have overcome in such a poised and graceful way in such a short amount of time. Oh, I don't know if it was poised or graceful. Well, I guess I'm just talking about what I'm seeing today. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. What yeah. you can tell is that you have processed a lot. Yeah. You have felt a lot. Yeah. Um, and that it has been effortful. Yeah. No, for sure. And I think it's not over, right? Like I do feel mm -hmm. way better today than I did three years ago. Um, but I think it's just... Yeah, it's just going to be complicated and trying to find yeah. the joy. I think the biggest thing for me is like the goal should have never been happiness. Yeah. Right. It should have been just health. Um, right. Having a good, healthy mindset because happiness is fleeting. Emotions are fleeting. They come and go. So how do we navigate all of them? So. Yes. Love it. Well, we honor you. Thank, thank you. you for sharing yeah, your story you for with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's yeah. been a delight. Yeah, Tara Herbert, thank you so mm -hmm. much for sharing your story with us, for coming all the way from East Coast. Yeah. And for sharing your story on Mormon Stories Podcast. I know it's going to help a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah. Our pleasure. Thanks, Margie. Thank you, Thanks John. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Appreciate you. Likewise. <laughs> And thanks to Julia and Maven and Gerardo and Brooklyn and everyone who makes the Open Stories Foundation possible. I'll just um, thanks uh, to our viewers and our listeners. Thanks to our donors that donate and uh, allow for uh, us to do what we do. And if, you know, because we lose donors every month, uh, people who just move on or lose interest or fall in financial hard times, 
if you're able to become a monthly donor, if you value this content, if you want to see it continue, um, just to show appreciation, you can go to mormonstories.org and uh, click on the donate button and become a monthly donor. And that's how we keep providing you with this content. So do that if you can. Please subscribe uh, on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. Like this episode if you can. Share it with anyone you think who might benefit. And uh, that's the way we'll help the algorithms push this story far and wide. Mm -hmm. And uh, most importantly, be good to each other, uh, be kind to each other, and we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody.